Good, so um, thank you everybody for joining us for our Deep Adaptation Q&A. And this month, I'm very pleased that Vanessa Andriotti, Professor Vanessa Andriotti is joining us. Uh, and also, uh, she's, she's been traveling, and so we had to make sure that the timing worked. And so, um, I'm not entirely sure, Vanessa, where you're joining us from. Could you say? I'm joining you from Pisac in Peru. In Peru. Fantastic. So thank you very much. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Vanessa is, um, she holds a Canada research, research Chair in Race, Inequalities and Global Change at the Department of Educational Studies at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver in Canada. And she's got extensive experience working across sectors internationally in areas of education related to global justice, <laughs> community engagement, indigenous knowledge systems and internationalization. And her research is focusing on analyses of historical and systemic patterns of reproduction of knowledge and inequalities and how these mobilize global imaginaries that limit or enable different possibilities for our coexistence and for global change. So I, uh, I've been having a really interesting few days reading uh, Vanessa's publication that Vanessa kindly gave me uh, when we met uh, a month ago or so, Global Citizenship Education, Otherwise Study Program. Uh, and the other the phrase here is gesturing towards decolonial futures. So the, the concept of decolonization is something that we're, we're going to cover today. It's something which uh, I think many people don't really understand what it means or, or they'll think, oh, is that something that really sort of uh, needs to be done now? And when I say that, I'm talking about people who are not sort of engaged in the field of uh, sort of international solidarity or activism but even people involved in environmental activism perhaps uh, not necessarily aware of the critiques about the forms of activism and the, the ways that we approach topics of climate change or global inequality inclusivity diversity and so on so Vanessa it's I think it's really important particularly for this new wave of climate activism we're seeing to hear um, from you and get a glimpse into the, the vast field uh, of decolonization studies um, and so thank you for joining us today on this call. And, uh, I, I'm the one who's in gratitude here. Um, I think that the connection between what you're doing in the deep adaptation uh, movement and what has been happening in terms of decolonization and decoloniality is extremely important, as you said. And I'm here to try to give you a brief overview, but um, we'll see with the questions at the end what people want to know. <laughs> yeah. So I'm wondering whether to start with theory or actually to start with something that's really real. Because I know one of the criticisms uh, I've heard of people who are maybe involved in environmental activism in we from Western middle class lifestyles or involved in deep adaptation in particular is, is that it can be very much about, it's quite conceptual, it's quite theoretical, it's anticipating terrible things and it's about how we feel and how we talk about this. And I just want to bring other realities into our conversation immediately. So I was wondering if you, rather than going theoretical, we could actually talk you're there in Peru. I was wondering if you could talk about the communities. The, who are you you're working with, who you might consider are somehow breaking down or being pulled apart, um, in part due to climate change? Um, or perhaps you see collapse as something that's, uh, something that's been, happened over time and been done to them as such. Um, and, and what we might what we might learn from, when I say we, I'm talking that many, many of the people on this, this call are from the, the West. They may not be privileged, but, but from, men, men, most of us are from, from the West. Okay, so one of the things that I think is important to, to say in the beginning is that there is a division between those who work with systemic historical violence and then those who work with unsustainability. And my research collective is trying to put the two together and say uh, we need to address them both um, together because if we, we can't learn from what has happened in terms of systemic violence, we can't really understand where collapse comes from and how our um, 
the systems that provides us with comforts, with securities and enjoyments, how they have been built on the broken backs of other people and of the earth itself. So this is, this is a connection that very few uh, groups are doing, but that is very important. I've just come back from a uh, gathering looking at um, ideas of the, what they would frame as the, um, the house, the, the house of, of modernity falling. We, in this group, it's a, it's a network of about 10 indigenous communities that uh, have a framework called um, Cinco Curas, which is, um, translates loosely as five cycles of healing. We actually started uh, from the concept of justice, five concepts of justice, cognitive justice, affective justice, relational justice, as a precondition for ecological and economic justice to come. And uh, the, the members of the community really said justice is not a concept that um, reflects what's needed. And partly it was because they were using um, a framework that where you have individualism and collectivism, which are frameworks that are acceptable within modernity. But for them, it is metabolism. We are all part of this um, metabolic organism that uh, we have forgotten about uh, because we think of ourselves as separate and uh, the metabolism is sick and we need to and because the metabolism is sick we're sick as well and we need to heal and healing uh, our thinking our sentience our feeling our relationships our exchanges and our cycles is um, a precondition for us to exist differently so one of the things they say for example is that when non-indigenous people come and ask them what their proposal is they are expecting a form of doing or a form of thinking and when they come up with the response that it is actually healing and it's a new form of existing, not just doing or thinking, <laughs> people generally don't understand what that means. And um, when we did, we actually adapted one of the deep adaptation um, exercises that we did in the retreat um, for the community. So we did um, the collapse exercise but translated into a language that people would understand related to, okay, in one station you lose access to supermarkets, gas stations, and um, banks. The other station you lose access to, it was a walk that they had to do. You lose access to um, the grid, the energy grid, um, uh, water, tap water, and um, treated sewage. And as we were doing it, many said, well, this is not collapse for us because this is our daily reality. And they, some people actually felt quite offended that we were talking about it as collapse because they can survive in that environment. And they found ways of um, not just surviving, but um, establishing community and establishing practices that are extremely valuable for us as well in those environments. And uh, the last station that we had was the um, uh, mental health collapse where we start killing each other. And no matter what we did to prepare, it's gonna be raided and there's gonna be a lot of violence. And what they said was that um, if relationships are not um, healed and not grounded, that's exactly what's gonna happen. So there's no point preparing if we are not healing the ways that we are feeling uh, or our sentience and accessing uh, what we call in the project exiled capacities and they access these exiled capacities through ceremonies and through entheogenic practices or through dances and festivals and other kinds of rituals so if we don't have a different neurobiology to work with the metabolism from a position of visceral responsibility we will end up trying to protect um, what we've got and or protect our families from violence erupting from um, diseased relationships. So I think that's an exa one example of, um, of a framework uh, that gestures towards deep adaptation, but from a very, very different onto metaphysics, I would say. Wow, so you've gone right to the heart of the matter there. My, I don't know if uh, my, my Zoom collapsed on me, I had to restart. So I missed out a little bit about which community you were talking about, where you've been having these conversations and gaining this insight and advice. 
We're ta it's a, a network called Teia das Cinco Curas. So most of the materials are only in Portuguese. I can send it if, if necessary. But right. it's 10 indigenous communities that uh, emerged out of a different network looking at the five justices framework. <laughs> but they mm -hmm. were all already, uh, they all had an understanding that the house of modernity was going to fall and that the house of modernity was going to fall on them first hmm. because this house was built on their back. For those who don't know what modernity means in your framework, could you just say what, what it means for you or what it means to them when they use sure. it? Because it's kind of like shorthand for a whole range of, of, of things, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes. Um, the shorthand of the shorthand is um, that is the way they refer to it in the in the project between themselves is white people's house basically is going to collapse. So the settlers house is going to collapse because it's unsustainable and it has already be, has always been and it's and it's its maintenance is predicated on continuous violence. So the fact that it is um, that it is falling. Uh, <laughs> The, the framework we use is that this house is based on a foundation of separability. There's nation states and artificial borders being imposed on one carrying wall. The other carrying wall is universal reason, uh, one form of rationality and single story of progress development and human evolution also being imposed. And the current um, roof is the roof of shareholder financial capitalism, which then is structurally damaged in terms of um, maintaining the house because it's um, it depends on exponential exponential growth and consumption um, to to be maintained and uh, in the house there so this house is um, depends on extraction and expropriation to be built and it's exceeding the limits of the planet but at the same time we have to pay attention to the dynamics within the house there's a um, the stairs in the house of social mobility for example that is then perceived as the purpose of life and there are promises of a, a global middle class for all which do not consider the limits of the planet. So there are lots of crises right now in the house and the sewage, the, the, what we say there that the pipes, the sewage pipes are blocked and the shit is coming up. <laughs> so uh, people in the house uh, have already um, put all the waste back into the planet. People in, who are not in the house are either wanting to come in or have lost, mostly so, have lost their capacity to survive outside. So this is a, a massive, holistic, deep, challenging critique of, of where so many people are, are coming from, the worldview, so many real deep assumptions about themselves and about progress in society that perhaps people hadn't even realized. And, and so a lot of people are coming to a concern about climate change, uh, particularly in the West now, where it's quite new for them. Uh, and then, so even to question capitalism is quite radical, but you're going way deeper than that to actually say that the very way we just carry about our lives and think about ourselves and, and, it, and the, and the way that we will, you talk about neurobiological, the, the way that we're wired and the way that we mm -hmm. respond to a perception of threat, um, all that, all that, there's an invitation from the critiques that you've shared, but also from the wisdom from the people you're talking to, there's an invitation to just a total transformation of, 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 of how we are, how we are in the world. And you, you even mentioned entheogenic substances, um, but also spiritual dance and all sorts of things. So um, how, how, does it, how does it work for you when you, uh, you're at a Western university in Canada, when you're talking to people, um, maybe who, who are a bit worried about what climate change means with local forest fires or food prices going up, and then you're bringing this massive global critique and invitation to connect with and learn from indigenous peoples in Peru or, or, and everywhere. Brazil, how, yeah. <laughs> how, how is that working out for you? Uh, I think the timing is right to do these things, I guess. Um, uh, the, for example, with the fires in the Amazon, the university was very quick to actually ask um, and support somebody coming from this network who is in Acre, who is suffering um, the effects of the fires to come to the mm -hmm. university and talk. 
Um, on the other hand, there's also a lot of um, interest in, in psychedelic research at the moment. So when Poland came to my university, it was booked up um, like there, there, were, there were no seats left in five minutes uh, when they started selling the tickets and they sold the tickets. So there is a, a, a kind of a, a momentum in a window where, where talking about these things is not perceived to be uh, esoteric, I think. And uh, people are, and I think partly it is because of a, a global mental health crisis too. People are looking for ways of addressing the anxiety and the depression of um, having to deal with um, imminent um, end of the world as we know it, all right? Mm. Which is not the end of the world, period. It's just so, the end yeah. of something. So I've seen, I've seen very strange, unusual data like YouGov poll that said that uh, the majority of people in 20, 24 out of 28 countries think that climate change will hurt themselves in their own lives and will trigger wars. I mean, this is a, if this kind of research is, is backed up by other opinion polls, then, then we are seeing a real, as you say, this, and glo global anxiety, uh, or, um, and, theref and therefore, yes, a mental health issue. And so you find that people are asking very, they're ready for deep, critical questions. That could, go, that could go in a number of ways, though, couldn't it, Vanessa? I mean, it could yeah. be that people's turn away from global solidarity and curiosity about the other, yeah. the so-called other, uh, and turn inward and just want to protect them and theirs. How, yeah. how would you, how do you invite yeah. people that are feeling fear about the future as many people in deep adaptation conversation do, how do you invite them into this curious and um, oh, this, this, to have this appetite for actually letting go of everything that we thought we knew and welcoming a whole different way of being in the world? I think, um, I think first of all, I think one thing that you mentioned too before that has been our concern is the hijacking of this agenda by, by the right and the far right specifically um, that then uh, it manipulates fear and gets people to, to be polarized. And this is already happening in Brazil and in many other places. So mm. in this divides communities and divides families uh, in, in very cruel ways. And um, this is something we're, we're, we're keeping on the table to see. But uh, the, what they say there is that like um, the polarization um, exacerbates the same way of being. It, it takes it to 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 its limits because people. It's the unconscious uh, of people coming up, and um, I think we are realizing that the Cartesian person really only exists in a certain context. Once we are afraid of losing things, it's unconscious fears and insecurities that come up. And uh, the response to that it, from these communities is not a response of um, segregation or isolation. They invite people in and they invite people into processes of cleansing and healing out of necessity because they know that if we allow this exacerbation uh, to, to uh, reach a limit, it will become extremely dangerous uh, for all of us, right? Mm. So. There is an urgency there, but there's also, there are two issues. There's an, one issue of translation of what they are offering and what, uh, pe how people perceive them. That is an educational issue that we're working on. And there's also an issue of consumption. So a lot of people want uh, these things, but uh, are coming with a consumptive attitude that, um, and I'm not just talking about consumption of stuff, of objects, but I'm talking about the consumption of knowledge, of uh, relationships, of experiences as a mode of existing in the world that we learn inside that house. And um, once you approach this, even the entheogenics uh, in that way, it doesn't have the same effect. Uh, the invitation of the community for the antiogenics, for example, is that you cleanse yourself so that you can be of use to the metabolism or others. You don't do that to increase your creativity yeah. or functionality so, so within the capitalist system. Where metabolism is used as the word for the planet Earth or of the, the life force or something more local. 
it is used as the planet and beyond. So yeah. in the, depending on the context, we use land. So land is not just the soil, land is the body, land is the animals, land is the trees, land is the forest, and land is what has been and what will be. So we sh shifted it to metabolism because when people think about land, they, they still think about property <laughs> or resource and metabolism is alive. So yeah. the, um, the idea that this metabolism is biointelligent, that we are part of it and that it can speak through us once we are decluttered from all these other things we are using to cope with the traumas that, that are, some of them are collective and historical, some right. of them are individual and they have techniques and practices, not knowledge systems, but practices that can help us declutter. So we, we talk about decenter, dis, uh, disarm, declutter, and discern. Mm. So Vanessa, I'm realizing that, so I, I'm involved in this, this deep adaptation forum, which didn't exist seven months ago, and now it's grown. We have about 10,000 people engaged in our various different platforms. And the question has come up about whether we, why, why is it that, that we are fairly um, middle-class Western? Um, not, I mean, I don't want to erase the diversity that's already in this network, but still, we are still quite, quite Western. And so I was wondering, what do we do about that? And then there's almost like two questions of or, already, because I'm wondering, if one, one is if we turn our attention to the wisdoms and the deep critiques that you're, that you're connected to and you're offering, I do remember how there's sort of a, a niche in the West that's existed for ages, which is middle class people who are like in touch with uh, uh, indigenous people's wisdoms. And that actually is seen, therefore, as taking them away from mm -hmm. connection and solidarity and, 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 and being real with uh, working class communities uh, in their own countries. Um, mm -hmm. So there's almost like these, these two different things to, to, to respond to. One is getting real and getting engaged in the working classes in where you're based, but also the other is this much more deeper critique about the whole of modernity that you're, you're offering. Is there a cross-cutting sort of um, bit of guidance you could give? Is it, is it, because I was wondering, is it that just simply that people like me need to pay more attention to all the um, are currently underprivileged uh, in terms of the ability to communicate, to be heard, to influence all, all the different groups and peoples and so on? Or is there any advice you could give as we are going to go into a strategic review and decide what, 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 <laughs> what we on earth should we be doing in 2020? Uh, it is very complex, as you said, and complicated because uh, there are several layers of um, issues and problems that we haven't been able yet to sit with. So for example, the issue of inclusion is one that is, that is difficult because generally, even with my body inside the university, the idea is that you include a diverse body, but business goes on as usual, right? right. So you, you're there at the service of other people. And generally for um, white middle-class learning, you are instrumentalized for that learning. And um, if you refuse to do that, there you're punished, right? So people usually think about racism as like, I don't like white people, but actually in an institution, and I think it would be the same for the deep adaptation movement, it's the perception that you're, you're coming in through the back door, you are here to serve, and if you make a mistake, um, you don't have the benefit of the doubt, you're punished straight away, or if you refuse to do what you're supposed to do, you you're punished straight away. So there's that problem there that it can't be this relationship. It can't be this transaction. And um, people who are not used to um, seeing how the dominant system is violent need, need to learn how uh, even the expectations or, that they put on inclusion are violent on the body of those who are, who are included. On the other hand, <laughs> there, is also, there are also layers of the struggle of people of color and of black people and indigenous people. There's a political layer where um, people have to operate within the discourses that are given to them in a specific struggle that we're not of their making. Um, and then there is another layer which is existential, which is the layer that these communities are, that I'm working with are working um, on. 
right? So the communities I'm working on are of people who have been through the political struggle and given up, basically <laughs> saying, this is not gonna go anywhere. We need to go back to the uh, trunk of this. And it, it is a question of existence. It's not a question of politics for them. But there are other people in their communities who continue the political struggle and who will continue to, um, to draw the lines that need to be drawn to protect the territories, to protect the people from racism, to, uh, or, or genocide, right? To um, now with Bolsonaro wanting to invade the indigenous lands, to go and stay in solidarity with NGOs and lawyers to try to uh, push back on what the government wants to do. So there are lots of things that need to be done, I think, and lots of complexities we need to sit with. But I think for, for people who have not thought about these issues before, we have in that booklet that you show, there are three denials there, we have included another one. So there's the denial of systemic violence. We, it is a denial, we're using denial in terms of a sanctioned ignorance. We need to do our homework in relation to that, understand how we got to the place that we got now, not just wanting to jump into a solution or uh, another or a preparation for the collapse, but we need to understand why we are getting to collapse right now. The second one is unsustainability. Why is it that we denied the limits of the planet and how it is that the governments are still denying it, right? Then the third one is the denial of entanglement, the denial of the metabolism itself. How on earth did we come to see ourselves as separate from this, as separate from each other, as separate from the other animals, as separate from the earth? And the fourth denial that we included is the denial of the mag magnitude of the problem. So the idea for, that we need quick fixes, um, easy solutions, or that we need to look good, feel good, and do good and move forward. This, this is all getting on the way of us really growing up and saying, uh -huh. okay, we need yeah, to that step last, up Yeah, that last point. I mean, I, I am, I'm involved in a lot of conversations with people about how do we affect change on climate at scale. And yeah, there is this, there is this um, hmm, assumption that, that we're not somehow complicit um, and we're not somehow, you know, involved in all the all the all the bad stuff, um, and also a, a, a yearning to find a simple story of feeling still okay about oneself, <laughs> and and that means feeling that one is right and that one is ag agentic, uh, and there's that. I mean, it's it's okay to have that going on, but maybe not to be unconscious that that's what's happening when we when we're looking at what to do. I just want to say that. Um, Everyone on this, I, I've got a few questions that people have sent to Matthew, uh, only three, um, but please now then, you can in the next uh, few minutes, put your questions in the chat box or send them to Matthew and then I will call you uh, in, in, in a moment. Um, Vanessa, I just wanted to ask you before we move over to everyone else, um, the field of climate justice has been around for a while and I remember 10 years ago, this emphasis was about contraction and convergence, so how the West has caused the problem more than everywhere else, and therefore we should cut carbon more and we should fund other countries to do so. Um, and then now, but of course, deep adaptation is in a different realm, which is saying, well, this is, this is already damaging societies and it's gonna get far worse. Um, so the, I was wondering, how does your, analysis about decolonizing the conversation the and and, and 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 what's going on here how does that relate to the justice question and what does climate justice look like on adaptation um uh and who should decide you know is it is it is it basically we should be listening who should we be listening to to tell us what is fair what is just on the adaptation uh, agenda I think the, the journey starts with the systemic, historical, and ongoing violence, um, uh, addressing that denial, basically, that foreclosure. Because if we don't understand uh, how, just, how violence operates, even the concept of justice becomes extremely superficial. I still use justice in, in the academic work because it makes more, more sense to talk about that in the West than talking about healing. Healing can very quickly become very new age and uh, in, a not, in not a very good way because then it's all about um, the self again, 
in the innocence of the self, which is something we're trying to, to move away from. That's why we talk a lot about shit. So we say there's individual shit we need to compost, there's collective shit we need to compost, and we need to figure out how to compost individual shit so that we can show up differently to compost the, um, the affective, cognitive, and relational shit we have to compost that creates the economic and ecological problems that we're facing, right? So justice then starts, I think, from a position of wanting to show up differently from a, for a very, very messy uh, issue and having the stamina to do that. Now, if justice is um, a teleological process from A to B, right? So, okay, I'll do that and it's gonna be a checklist and lots of people ask for checklists a checklist so so that I can feel good about myself again, right? So that I, I don't feel complicit. This is actually part of the problem, right? So we are all, in, if we're all in the same metabolism, we are all complicit with the metabolism being sick, we're all sick. And therefore, we need to start from a grown-up position, not an infantilized position, because the house actually itself infantilizes us to be able to want to stay in the playground, right? To feel good, to look good, to do good and to move forward. What about, instead of moving forward, digging deeper and uh, taking responsibility so that, and viscerally, not just for our species, but for all species, so that um, if there is a chance this can be interrupted, uh, we will do what is needed rather than what we want to do. So there's one last, I think, m analogy that we use uh, here in Peru. It, was, it, it, it will, might look banal, but it actually, helps pedagogically. So we were uh, waiting to cross a very busy road here, very close to here actually. And uh, there was a group of 10 of us and we were waiting for the traffic to stop a little bit. But this very little dog decided to, um, to cross the street. And it was really interesting to observe the, re the response of people in the group who already have the critique and all of that, we were working together. So some people just close their eyes, other close their ears, other close their mouth. Some people froze, other people just had this, this different reaction that they couldn't move, but they had a, a jolt, right? And one person went to the middle of the road and stopped traffic. And the person who did it didn't calculate whether or not she was gonna get hurt or what was gonna happen. She just stopped tra traffic, the dog passed, and she went after the dog and didn't even realize she had done it. So we will need, more people who can stop traffic, even if it goes against their self-interest. My interest is in what kind of education and what kind of unlearning process do we need to be able to declutter to that level, mm. right? So we, so we have we a question. That. Yeah, we have a question coming in on that and uh, from my colleague um, uh, who you've met, Katie Carr. So. Uh, <laughs> We'll take a question from Katie and everybody else also, please do now. Uh, if you've got a question inside you, go on, be brave. Just put it in the chat and you might get selected because we've got about uh, 20 odd, 25 minutes, I think, to go. Good. So, Katie. I've got two questions. I don't know which one you wanted. Hi, Vanessa. Hello. Um, I'm going to go with, with my second one because it was um, more relevant to what you were just talking about. My question is, how do you invite people into voluntary reconfiguration of the self, or which is obliteration of the self, and how do you do it in a non-violent way? $10 million question. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you invite people? We, we start with a, a kind of a lighter invitation to shed your ignorance, egg arrogance actually, and poop your vanity. So you use humor a lot. Um, to do that, but uh, we're already working with people who are looking, who, for whom what worked before is not working already. It's, this is not something you just go around and say, okay, everybody, let's just uh, try to dissolve the self that we've learned and find another way, a more layered way of, of, of sensing the self. Uh, we do invitations that are kind of, um, hook invitations to see who is actually looking for that but this is not something you put down people's throats basically that's what we've learned in the long uh in the long haul and making the invitation clearer too has helped a lot so now we before we were kind of 
finding it very difficult to say like because we would put something in front of people and people would say okay that's for me to feel good for me to look good and for me to do good and for us to move forward and now we are if we've learned that uh, that projection on the on what we're doing actually wastes a lot of resources and a lot of time and a lot of energy so now we're saying look not everybody needs to do this right now we're working with the people who want to dig deeper and to relate wider if that is what's calling you then maybe what we're doing might be interesting for you we have in terms of scalability we have a question of momentum right i think there's going to be a momentum where things that used to work are not going to work anymore where more people will want this kind of thing but we need to learn now so that by the time more people can have it we can hold space for more people we kind of know better what we're doing because it's it's a little bit kind of um touching things in the dark uh dealing with the unconscious right so we're trying to uh, weave different kinds of uh, practices that have been around but also put a decolonial perspective on them and a metabolic perspective on them. Things like, for example, that came up in uh, the Deep Adaptation Retreat, Family Constellation, or even Boal's um, Theater of the Oppressed, the, uh, Rainbow of Desire. Um, there are many other techniques that have been around, but they're still focusing on an anthropocentric um, and not necessarily decolonial perspective, but once we can translate them into um, this idea of uh, preparing for the end of the world as we know it in the dissolution of the self, they can be extremely useful uh, in, in what uh, we will be doing together. But you, you hit a spot there. It's fascinating, very, oh. fascinating. And thank you, Katie, for the question and Vanessa for that, that reflective answer. I'm gonna go to Tom now because it's also then it's connected, I think, because then there are institutions out there that uh, relate to reconfiguring the self. And what are they, Tom? And what's your question? Uh, uh, thanks, Jim. Hi, Vanessa. Um, it's Tom from London, England. Um, I had, I guess, a question in two parts um, relating to um, religion, however you want to take that word in all its uh, breadth and tension. Um, I guess the first part was about the indigenous communities that you're working with and I suppose I have a, a question about how much they are looking backwards or, or seeking to go backwards to a, an older way of being uh, and their sort of ancient traditions or to what extent they're reinventing those for the present and future challenges. So there's that question about um, those communities. Um, and then I, I suppose there's a second part, a question about mainstream uh, religious traditions. Um, I'll leave it up to you to um, ad address that, but um, whether you think they are equipped or have resources to draw on, even if it needs reinventing, um, that might help as well, um, or whether you see that the only hope is with the indigenous peoples who've held on to that older way of being and not been so infected. I think the way the best way to respond to you is a distinction that we make in the project about um, modernity focusing on form and um, other traditions focusing on the direction of things. So if you are trying to create a perfect form uh, and that is that's going to be permanent, uh, you're using language to index things and create things that will last. If you're using language in a movement kind of way, then the, the question really changes. So there is no, the, the backward and forward also go because people are just responding to a context and the movements of a context, right? So these people would say, for example, the internet is extremely important for the movement, but the relationship we have with the forest and with the other animals and with the enchanted ones, which are the spirits uh, around that, um, the old one, the ancient one, was much deeper than the one we have now. So we, it's a movement where we go, um, there's the backward and forward, it's complicated. We go deeper probably, right? 
and we also go wider in terms of um, using technology differently. Once I had the, one elder showing me a mobile and saying, what do you think this is? And I was like, well, what does she want me to say? Should I just say that we shouldn't use mobiles? In the end, what she wanted was to say, this is blood minerals. This is the blood of Mother Earth. And then, and then she said, do you throw it away? And I said, and I said maybe. <laughs> she said, no, you use it. You use it to stop the violence, right? So that's the kind of thing that happens in, that, in relation to the first question. The second question, I think in every religion, there are uh, also this um, the, the transcendence and immanence, right, happening in everywhere. So in Christianity, there are different strands. Um, in Umbanda, which is the Afro religion here, there are different strands that go either towards more form or more the directionality of things. I'm seeing the directionality is getting together to say, look, we need something else. And we, we can have, um, a, it, because they work more with mystery and unknowability, not just the unknown, but the unknowable that they can get together in, we, we were talking about that just in the gathering. It's like the, the sacredness of the mixture <laughs> of not really paying so much attention to form, but to where it's taking us. And if it's taking us to, to more responsibility, more visceral responsibility, if it's taking us towards being together to face the storm that is coming, um, then, then they, would, they would connect somehow away from separability, right? But the form religions that say there's always just one truth and it's this truth and my truth is not your truth, therefore you stay over there, um, they exacerbate the polarization. And that's partly what's happened, what has happened in Brazil when, for example, in the, in the 60s, 70s, 50s, 60s and 70s, liberation theology, which is a Christian strand, worked really well with Afro-descendant religions um, to take care of poor people and create community at the base. Once um, this shifted towards representational democracy, after the dictatorship was over, then um, evangelical movements came in with a Protestant work ethic, which is much more individualized and much more dogmatic. And that then broke the communities and many people say that that's the reason why we have Bolsonaro, the far right president, um, being elected today. Does that help? Thank you. Yeah, that's so much. This is, you're being given huge questions, aren't you, to to answer? But thank you, Tom, for the question. Um, uh, I uh, I'm just looking at the time. Actually, although I've I've been telling Matthew, my colleague, that maybe we we couldn't fit uh, two more questions in. Well, let's give it a go. So, Christopher, um, you have. You have two questions, but I'm interested in the first one, um, which is, uh, I, I love it. So um, over to you, Christopher. Yeah, hi. Um, as I've been, uh, well, thanks to Joanna Macy and you, Jim, uh, been able to grieve about my, you know, upbringing. And I just sort of wonder, is it, does my generation need to die off to be able to allow something new to come? Or, and I'm someone who's had near death experience, so I know you can shift a lot. But my layers of colonization from day one of being a consumer of everything everything, people, workshops, stuff, life, everything in this room, you know, I sometimes wonder can I uncouple from all that? Really? Thank you. Yeah. A very good question. I, I, I don't know how deep this is in our unconscious, right? So this is, we're trying experiments upon experiments to see what we can do um, to create that situation of the stopping of the traffic thing. But I've seen people of all uh, generations do that. And uh, like coming from this experience in the gathering and seeing how people treat the elders there, I like the idea of discardability is completely out of the question in that sense, right? So, um, and they do have a sense of who, who are the wiser elders who go deep and who are the elders who 
had a different life and who just need care. And um, it was very humbling for me too, because it made me realize how much more care I should be giving my parents even, because it, it didn't really matter at a certain age, what is it that you're even doing or saying you receive the respect that, that, that you deserve because your, your life is honored. And that's where I think we should be going, not in any different direction uh, from that. I think that is a direction of the metabolism. I'm wondering if part of that honoring is, could we find any sort of meaning from that process of separation, the kind of what we've created with modernity and civilization as we know it or call it now? Is there anything in it that was somehow necessary? Was somehow life, the metabolism doing its thing in some way mm -hmm. so that we can honor it and say goodbye? We talk about hospicing uh, a lot. So providing palliative care to the system dying. And that's where most of the lessons come because we are not, but we cannot be afraid of death in that case. So if you're not afraid of death, we can actually look at what has happened and open the space with this death to something new. But opening the space without this learning, this deep learning that need, and unlearning that needs to take place will just open the space for more of the same. The same thing will come back to teach us again the lessons that we have failed to learn. So providing palliative care, what we say generally in the project is that it's not glamorous. It is actually like sometimes cleaning vomit and diarrhea. And it, it's not something we'll do somebody will do to put in their Facebook page or to be agentic <laughs> or innocent. <laughs> like, and you sit with the person to hear the stories. And sometimes the person is kicking and screaming, not wanting to go. And sometimes there's peace and there's calm and there's a profound reflection on what has happened. So how do we um, cre create the conditions for more palliative carers who are ready to do what's needed, not what they want to do? And that's what I I'm, that's I mean, that, that takes me back to the start when you told me about the wisdom and the suggestions coming from the indigenous communities you're working with. Rather than there being anger, blame, retribution, there's sort of a, a desire to offer wisdom, healing. Um, and so that's, yeah, that sense of that we are all part of the same thing and that there is an opportunity for people who have been playing a role in a within modernity at the top of the pile some of us in modernity to 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 learn and to find new forms of meaning um as everything collapses so we talk, um, we talk about sensefulness uh because meaning when we say mean i know meaningfulness has okay. become a very important thing but um, articul it is related then to articulated uh, languaging or wording. It's often when, when we say meaning, people think that it's something that can be apprehended, basically. And we've been talking about sensefulness because there are lots of ways of, that the body makes sense that do not make sense in a meaningful way. I see. So hmm. you can find sensefulness in that. However, it is important at this point to say that in another layer, there is a political movement for redress that is extremely important that pushes, right? The politics and pushes um, policies and relationships to the brink of something. And that, it, because sometimes people say, okay, so it's all about them being one. Um, and then those who are pushing are, are wrong. No, those who are pushing are really important. <laughs> And it is really important to remember that if we're going to be one, we are one with the flowers, the whales, the sun and the moon, but also with the violence and the shit. That is yes. what is necessary to remember. Thank you for, absolutely. And uh, not too many people say that. And it's quite a powerful thing that comes through in your pamphlet as well. And, and also when we've talked, um, we only have a few minutes to go, three minutes. And so final question, please very quickly and a quick answer. Cause we, we have to be, okay. we have to be off. So it's uh, um, I'm told to, I pronounce your name, Mothir, uh, Mothir Rahman, who works with Extinction Rebellion. Thank you for joining us. Over to you. Hi, Vanessa. Hi. Um, I wrote the question into the chat, so I'll just try to... Uh, um, it's, it's a problem that some, 
um, that I'm finding within some of the groups as well that uh, in Extinction Rebellion that some are focusing so much on demand one telling the truth and the truth is getting there about uh, getting out there about climate collapse but then the systems of power aren't changing sufficiently so that potentially big business are already moving to investing in renewables and moving their pension funds to renewables which then the metals and other things are needed um, in countries like Chile where there's already sort of wars coming out so what is the risk in the idea of decolonial futures in plural that we miss the opportunity actually we just continue the separation that the west will look away again and just say well we need to protect ourselves and this is one way investing in renewables and just further separation rather than a coming together thank you and uh wow what a question and you've got one minute <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> So there are many understandings of decolonization and there are some texts that can help uh, disentangle that. But the understanding of that I'm working from is precisely the undoing of separability. separability. So the recolonization that we're talking about, that you are talking about in terms of capitalism shifting in order to recolonize is part of a colonial process um, that is not the kind of gesturing towards a decolonial future or decolonial futures. Futures, it's because we don't know what it's going to look like. Uh, that's why we keep it open. But um, I can suggest a couple of texts that talk about these different understandings. It's not about replacement of one knowledge by another. It's about a different way of being. But different people would define it very differently. It's a multiple layered struggle. And uh, some of these layers, as I said before, are really important, the ones that push, because they open up spaces where we can actually do the work. If they were not there, uh, people would be too complacent, right? So it's, it's paradoxical and contradictory, but um, I think the point that we're trying to make is the shift in the direction and the vitality of it towards a metabolic intel intelligence that can help us exist very differently. It's a, it's a key issue and it's, I'm sorry we don't have more time to discuss it. Uh, on the Deep Adaptation Forum, um, there's, there'll be a, a, a thread on this because uh, tomorrow I'm, I'm publishing a, a, a blog related to the kind of issues we're talking about uh, and we'll be talking about Extinction Rebellion and climate justice and decolonization. So um, I'll make sure that uh, I post that in all the different platforms we have. Um, and so, uh, yeah, wow, what a, what a fascinating hour, Vanessa. That went really fast. Thank you for joining us and thank you everyone thank uh, you. for joining us. This video is going to be online tonight. Um, so it's going to be um, on our YouTube channel. So um, if you, you can find that on, um, on, just go to the Ning and there'll be a link there. So um, I'll also put it on my blog, jenbendel.com tonight, so people can find it. So please share it with everybody. Uh, and those of you who want to support us doing all this into next year, remember our crowdfund is happening. Um, Katie, you've been putting some really useful links in there. Can you put our crowdfund link in? Um, that would be brilliant too. So um, thank you, Vanessa. Cheers, everybody. And um, see you next month for Charles Eisenstein, um, which I'm sure will be very interesting too. Bye-bye. <laughs>